My name is Charles Rogel, and I'm the Vice President of Products and Marketing at DecisionWise. I'll be the moderator for today's presentation. Our presenter is Dr. Marcy Fetzer. Hi. Marcy is a Principal Consultant at DecisionWise and leads a team of consultants who deliver organization development services to clients around the world. She holds a PhD in organization communication from the University of Utah, where her research focused on the application of transformative conflict management strategies to bureaucratic organizational structures and dysfunctional communication. I need to change that next time. It's hard for me to, there you go. to say. You can change it in your own words. Something simpler, layman <laughs> term. Uh, she's an expert in organizational development, human behavior, conflict management, business communication, and in, in, uh, interpersonal relationships. DecisionWise has been in business since 1996. We just celebrated our 20th birthday. And we specialize in using feedback to promote leadership and organization development. We're growing. We recently made the Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing companies in America for the second year in a row. This session is based on one of the modules from our leadership development training programs. In fact, this topic is so important that we include it in all three of our programs for senior leadership mid-level managers and new leaders in the organization, the topic being uh, more about conflict. Before we begin, I have a few items to cover. This webinar is scheduled for 60 minutes. Everyone is on mute, so if you have questions, uh, please use the question tool to submit them and we will answer them as we go. This presentation has been approved for one credit hour toward HRCI and SHRM recertification, and I'll provide those codes to you after the webinar. And the slides for today's presentation can be found in the handout section of the toolbar. If you click over on the handouts, you can download the PDF version right now and follow along with us. So Marcy, let's talk about uh, this definition of personality and kind of the theories behind it. Okay, great. Thank you, Charles. So a lot of times as I work in organizations with lots of different levels of leaders, et cetera, um, you know, I'll give them a lot of tools and talk to them through conflict strategies, et cetera. And oftentimes people will say, well, that's really helpful, and really interesting, except for I really think it comes down to a personality. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily that it's communication or, you know, et cetera. It's that this person has just a difficult personality. I work with this guy. <laughs> you would not believe. Yeah, my boss. I've heard that so many times before. It's just, and I can't figure out how to work with this personality more than anything. So I thought that it would be nice to um, just develop some curriculum around personality and what is what is personality and what does it mean? What do we do with different personalities? And so we are going to talk a little bit about personality theory, but we're also going to talk from a psychological standpoint. We're going to also use what I really love and have studied for a long time, which is relational communication theory. Mm -hmm. So it's our what do we do with these different personalities and more importantly, what do we do with a relationship um, that is um, created with the mixing of two personalities? So we'll get right into that. So to begin, um, what we want to do is just kind of take a quick stroll through the history of personality theory. Um, this is um, this is very much an overview. But um, as the slide says, there's not really a single agreed upon definition of personality. And there's lots of theorists who have given us a lot of really information, a good information and insights about what is personality, where does it come from, how does it um, you know, evolve over time, et cetera. Um, but it's something that is, it's, it is part of our genetics, it's part of our socialization, and it arises within an individual. And oftentimes, it's formed in the early years. You know, oftentimes, kind of nine years old is um, sometimes stated as the area in which we've really come to form our personality. Um, but then it, it does change through different forms of conditioning or social interaction. Mm -hmm throughout our life that influences who we are. But our personality, our core key like personality traits, characteristics, are established early on. And a lot of those do have a genetic neurological component. So it's too late for me to really change <laughs> my kids' personality right. since they're all over 10 years old now. And yourself as well. Yeah. As much as your wife might say. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this idea of trait theories, is, to me, is pretty fascinating. And essentially what it is is this idea that um, personalities are centered on the concept that it's, um, we have these broad traits or disposition that combine together and with this combination it creates our unique mm -hmm. personal personality. Okay. okay. Our fingerprint. Exactly. Our 
fingerprint print personality. So this is a, a general um, overview of just the over time how some of the theories have evolved. So we know about Freud um, and his thoughts about personality um, in the psychosexual development um, kind of theorizing. Then Erickson did, went into stage theory. We have certain stages in which our personality is developed in adolescence, mm -hmm. et cetera, those affect who we become um, through those different interactions with different stages of life. Neuro um, neurotic needs theory, um, we will have these basic anxieties and um, how that kind of, um, how using coping mechanisms affect and, and, and create sort of this personality. So these are some of the basic psychoanalytical theories and we don't have a lot of time to go deep into that, and that's not the purpose of this webinar, but we also have behavioral theories with classical conditioning, um, and we know that the best example of that is behavioral learning theory, um, where we have sort of these neutral stimuli that are um, paired with our responses, mm -hmm. and associations have a big determination of how we end up and how we sort of see the world. Pavlov's a very well-known sort of theorist in this realm as well as then we have what we also call operant conditioning, which is another kind of behavioral theory that is similar to this classical conditioning idea, um, but father of which was B.S. Skinner, who talked about positive and negative reinforcements and how we can use different kinds of techniques to direct behavior. And that doesn't necessarily change or modify our personality, but it certainly has an effect on who we be, who we become. Mm -hmm. How we do. Things. I am motivated from you know from having an interaction with this environmental stimuli, whether positive or negative, and that has a bearing on how I perceive the world and how I choose to behave. Okay. So there are a number of traits, and um, sixteen have become kind of the well-known um, traits that most of us have a level of. Um, I think I've got all of these. We do. Most of us have a level of all of these. Um, and um, even more than this, we've, we've come to this idea of the big five. Uh -huh. right? There's the big five that um, have actually are, are found in most of these 16. But the big five, if anyone has taken a, a big five personality test, they are really kind of the core traits that um, we have, like primary or um, secondary sort of nature toward. So I might be very, um, you know, within the category of extroversion. You know, we talk a lot in, in even just normal dialogue about extroverts, introverts, but also in the research about what does that mean to be um, highly extroverted or introverted or can I be both and how does that affect my personality and how I see the world and how I behave in the world. So all of these kinds of traits we can understand as we, we take assessments like the MBTI or the, the Big Five or the Hogan to kind of give us an idea of where we are um, within the spectrum of all the different traits that are available. Because each of these personality traits have a spectrum, right? You can mm -hmm. be, mm -hmm. um, you know, very, you know, have a strong desire for close relationships or not. Absolutely. I've been doing a lot of research lately in perfectionism. It's an area of huge interest to me as I've seen it become, um, when it becomes a, an, a, an extreme level, mm -hmm of uh, personality that it's a very, it can become a big derailer for people. Mm. In other words, um, and I've worked with quite a few perfectionists and, and myself admittedly having some of these tendencies where it's more of the, um, it, it can become an OCD sort of, um, or a maladaptive personality trait when it gets too far where you get obsessive mm. or compulsive about, I have to have everything perfect. Yeah. I can't send an email until I've reviewed it five or six times and made sure all the grammar is exactly right. I have to make sure everything makes sense. I have, you know, we can't become yeah. almost obsessive and not just with email, but then with my organization system or my, my performance and my results. And when we get, when it becomes too far or maladaptive or extreme, um, it becomes uh, problematic because especially when I see with 360s, oftentimes people will say, um, you know, that this leader is such a driver, you know, because their, their own self um, view is that it has, we have to keep working until it's perfect, 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 yeah. get to the point where our, the people that we're working with can't stay up with that, the individual can't stay up with that, and it just kind of unravels, uh -huh. and that creates a lot of anxiety in the per 
person that doesn't, has that extreme perfectionism because it's like I'm never achieving never it, good I'm enough. failing, yeah. I'm, you know, and it becomes um, very difficult actually. Hmm. So now let's talk about uh, personality and relational dynamics. Okay. So the personality and relational, the typo, sorry. Oh, well, yeah, I got it. Gotta... <laughs> meant to say relational dynamics um, is supposed to, uh, it, rather it is when we think about, okay, I have a specific personality. As we were talking about it earlier, and I have someone in my workplace that has a specific personality. Now, we oftentimes I'll hear, well, it's not me, it's the, this person's personality difficult, right? Mm -hmm. And so what, what I want to kind of remark to is the idea that um, I have a personality, you have a personality, one plus one, but that actually creates a third personality. So we have our own unique relationship personality. And so if, if we all had, if it's kind of like a one size fits all, everybody has this same personality in every single relationship, then what we would see is every person having the same problems with the same person. Does that make sense? Also, yeah. it's like if the boss was really just a difficult personality, and they may or may not be, but that relationship, if, if it didn't co-create with a different personality and create its own personality, what we see is a consistent uh, inability to form and create relationships um, across the board. And I have seen versions of that, but that's more of an extreme difficult personal personality yeah. <laughs> um, situation. So what we're um, what we're talking about today, and we can just go to the next one, is this idea of one plus one. And when we're talking about relational personality, is a third personality. So our sixteen personality traits combine in unique ways to make up who we are, and our personality combines with another's to create another unique combination of relational personality. Now what I have found more than anything is it's not necessarily um, as useful to say this is who I am and this is who they are and we're having trouble so I need to figure out how I either need to change or how they need to change. What, what it is more useful is to say I have a unique personality, they have a unique personality, together we co-create a unique relational personality and we need to focus on that co-creation of personality to see what we can do differently. Yeah, because sometimes other people manage to work well with them, and you just can't. And you're wondering, is it me? What's going on here? I don't. Exactly. I think I'm normal. <laughs> yeah. No, really. So it's 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 something that we have to realize is like looking at the whole, looking at the two together creates a unique interaction that has actually some. And we'll get into that as we go. Some really interesting ways of um, measuring it, so that we can see where we need to change. And it's pretty fascinating. So that's where we'll get into uh, relational um, communication theory. Which is our next slide. Yeah. So the relational communication theory was a theory that I learned as a young graduate student from L. Edna Rogers, who studied at Stanford. She had, start, she had learned um, of this from some work she had been studying from Gregory Bateson, who was married to Margaret Mead, a pretty famous cultural anthropologist. I don't know any of these people. <laughs> okay. I like the information. Okay, good. <laughs> and so uh, we know from Gregory, Gregory Bateson's observation in the South Pacific was that although he couldn't understand the language of the people that um, he was interacting with. As a cultural anthropologist, he was down there studying. With, well, his, wife, his wife was studying. Right, okay. right. She was doing the work of the cultural anthropologist work, and he was studying human behavior and, and, and relational interaction. And he would observe interaction and his own interaction. And he'd say, although I wasn't um, able to understand the language, I could, I could, I began to be able to observe unique behavior that I could feel comfortable in assessing whether the health of the relationship. Okay. Uh -huh. And what uh, Ella and Rogers said was, I think we can code this and, and scientifically measure it mm. and see how a relationship is doing based on choices of communication um, within the relational context. So you know the famous saying, it's not what we say, but how we say it, right? Mm -hmm. That counts. So what we know about this particular, within the context of this relational communication theory, is, yes, it isn't just what you say or how you say it, but how you're doing it within your relationship dynamics 
that really is almost more important than the first two. Yeah. So if we're doing okay, and I know that I, I can sense that within our interaction, I, I know like, like I see you every day and I, and I feel like we're in good shape within our relationship, that it's even, it's much simpler for me to say, Charles, there's something that I need to talk to you about, knowing that, you know, and you're sensing, oh boy, this sounds like it might be a difficult conversation that's coming up. Uh -huh. I'd say, um, I, there's something I need to talk to you about. If our relationship is in sort of this healthy dynamic, that relationship is going to be easier for both of us. Yeah, that conversation. Yeah, that conversation rather. Yeah, and so what I what I what I'm trying to sort of describe, and and I think it, it it's a really it's personality, but it's also relational health that is the key to understanding how to work with difficult personalities. So what we know is um, every time we have a a conversation, we can have what are considered one ups, one downs, and one overs, or leveling is also the yellow arrow. And if we have too many of any sort of similar pattern, then we, then we can be mindful of that. So if our relationship has too many one-ups, which is a vie for control, okay. in particular we have three or four in a row. So explain what that looks like. We're heading into conflict. So if I say to you, uh, Charles, I need you to do this today, uh -huh. and your, your schedule's slammed today. Uh -huh. And you say back to me, this is not a good time. In all caps. In all caps. <laughs> and then I say to you, I don't care if this is a good time or not. This is what you need to do today. Huh. Right? So our relationship is kind of in, a, in this moment of what's, where, how are we doing, right? So yeah, with three up arrows. We've had basically kind of three up arrows in a row. Now, whatever happens next is really um, important. And so, if I if I go down, that that would be that would be something where I actually give you you know you know on second thought, I'm sorry that I was assuming that you could just drop everything and do it right now. And mm -hmm. as I think about it, you know, tomorrow tomorrow would probably be okay. Would that work okay for you? I guess so. Okay. So we're doing. We just turned our communication into a new into a new kind of arena that is more healthy, right? That is more, we're, we're being a little more accommodative, we're being a little more considerate, right? And so that's kind of the one up, one down. One over is just this sort of neutral, like let me let me consider that a little bit longer. It's a pause, it's a reflective, um, let me kind of tell you what I heard you saying moment. Uh -huh. And all of these kinds of communication moments or transacts can shape and change the course of our communication and our relationship. Whereas we might be just saying it's difficult personality, it really might be just a difficult interaction or it might be just a tense situation. Yeah. And so we're mindful of how's our communication functioning. Now the, the key is, let's go to the next slide because this shows the, the transact. So you say something to me, Charles, and that's the A. A lot of people kind of get into this mi mindset of I have to react to what's presented to me and I'm going to oftentimes I don't, not I have to, but oftentimes I feel compelled to just sort of react. Or resist in some way. Respond, yeah, in a way um, that is sort of reflective of what was the way that was spoken to me. Okay. You apply in kind. Right, right. And we absolutely don't need to do that, but we have to be mindful of it because we often have emotional response. So we'll just often kind of just have that quick emotional response, right? So if I say to you, I need to do this, I need you to do this now, and especially if we're in a context of our relationship is a little strained, or I, you, think you consider me a difficult person, mm -hmm. you're going to have even more likelihood to sort of push back. But you might not say anything; you might do it non-verbally, or you might kind of stew on it. You might, whatever your emotional response is, right? Yeah. What's so important to realize is that what actually happens in the B transact, so how you respond to me, is oftentimes where most of the power resides. So if I say to you, I need to do this now, and you take a moment and you really engage sort of the, that logical analytic, not the, you sort of move out of that emotional response and you start yeah. to say, I need to pause for just a moment and think about this. That's leveling is that pause, right? So you're giving, you're breathing a little air into the interaction and saying, let me think about this. Let me figure out if what I want is really to have that emotional response or if I really want to make sure that I have a good working relationship. So then you, you respond to me in a way that might be a level or it might be a down or it might be a one up. 
And what, what is so important is mindfulness and saying, instead of letting my sort of emotional response take over, I am going to think through this and I'm going to sort of maneuver within this relationship and this communication to actually give me what I want in the long term. So it's, it's kind of like if, if you've never really asked me for something immediate like that and now, yeah. I'd be somewhat surprised and say, oh, well, well, tell me about this. What's going on? Sure, I can help you. What, what do you need? And That's a really and, good leveling. And so you, you're trying to understand the need because this is somewhat of a surprise. But if you've always come in and demanded things, that you didn't really need now, but yeah. you've always asked for, and you're always kind of you know, yeah. pushing the envelope with me, mm -hmm. and I find out later that you didn't really need it that soon, now I'm more skeptical and I'll be more defensive. That's right. And so you have to say, is this something that um, is an interaction? Is it, is it something that I can just sort of work through within the communication? Or is this sort of a personality? And then what do I do with sort of this style of personality? And so you consider both, and that was my point at the beginning. We need to consider the personality plus the relational dynamics. Okay. And oftentimes we will have difficult personalities, right? Yeah. But we have, if we look at this sort of slide here, we always have that power of the B response, mm -hmm. and we need to not lose sight of that. Because it's so, so valuable. It's this sort of theory that I've been working on for a long time with a colleague of mine, the university is, we have choices, we have consequences, we have outcomes, right? That's the, that's the sort of the equation of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. If we can remember that we have choices that lead to particular consequences and those that, that lead to those outcomes, and we want a particular outcome, then and we can think about it through the process of all of this interaction, which is a lot of work to do, yeah. I believe. <laughs> it's hard to think it's about. Hard to it's, like the, it's like the Communication Olympics sometimes, yeah. it's like in your mind. But we can get to a better outcome by having that thought process and not just being emotional about it. Sure. So it's, it's a lot of, like we said, it's a lot to think about, but it's truly uh, very, very powerful. And I've seen, um, I've seen it in, in real, real time where you ask specific questions to get a different result to create the outcome you're looking for. So don't trust that first thought that pops into your head and you've got to respond. Especially if you're experienced what's called flooding and that's that feeling that we've all experienced where I can feel myself getting upset or worked up. Yeah. If you feel that you're flooding or you're triggered, take a sec take a moment and say, if I choose to respond the way that I want to, what's the outcome that that's going to lead to? That's a, that's a choice that has consequences. Yeah. And it will lead to a particular outcome. Is that the outcome that I actually want? Or shall I move in a different direction so I get to a better outcome for me? Okay. In the health of a relationship. So we talked about the three up arrows, and, and oftentimes sort of these arrows get um, a bad name because it's like, well, if we, do we just stay out of the, the one up? Is that the strategy then? Um, and the truth of the matter is, no, we, we're, we're building a relationship that's healthy enough that we can have conflict. Conflict can be very productive. We've talked about that before in other webinars. Mm -hmm. because we want people to have the ability to speak their mind and be able to be productive in our meetings and not just everyone agreeing with everyone and having artificial harmony. Sure. And so what, we, what, we're, what we're looking for is um, uh, recovery. We're looking for repair. We're looking for moments where we can change the course of the conversation. So if we have relatively good relational dynamics and I need to have a tough conversation with you and I know that I'm going to have to have some one up, what I want to make sure is that I've done the work on sort of the front end and the back end to have a lot of positive interaction with you, to have moments where I'm going one down so that I will accommodate or I'll say, let me think about that, or you're right, I'm sorry, that was wrong of me, so that when we do have sort of these uh, difficult conversations or more tense communication, they're embedded within a context that is able to handle that just fine. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. So. That's, this is kind of the diagram that we're looking for variety is best. So oftentimes um, people will ask me about this one up, one up, one up pattern. I'll say if you think about it, oftentimes a one up, one down pattern consistently is, could be more problematic than just a one up, one up. One up is, is kind of very strong personalities vying for control um, over long periods of time. Uh, one up, one down is often dominance in sort of a submissive relationship where one person's always kind of asserting the control and one person's doing more of the submissive role. Mm -hmm. And then one down, one down, if you've ever lived in that 
kind of relationship. <laughs> Nobody can make a decision about anything. Where do you want to go? Needs, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Do you want to go here? Oh, I don't know. That sounds pretty good. I don't know. What do you want to do? And it's, it can be extremely frustrating because um, somebody needs to make a decision and um, there's not a lot of willingness to. Yeah. Somebody needs an opinion. Mm -hmm. So variety is best and leveling can help. And that pausing, asking questions, naming the game, saying, let's talk about what our communication is doing right now and, and even rephrasing things. Um, this is a really interesting slide about the unconscious dynamics that often steer relationships. And I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but in the research there's some interesting dynamics about the relationships um, where we have this particular style. Someone who has extremely high demands and someone who has the desire to sort of withdraw from, um, especially from like maybe a, a tense interaction. If someone's very demanding and someone is having a real difficulty with that particular style and wants to withdraw. So that particular dyad um, is difficult to have good relational dynamics um, when that's the case um, as the prom like sort of the prominent um, style. The second one is similar but a little differently. So your pursuer and distancer. Someone who, if you're having this conflict, com so the first one would look like I'm demanding you of this, and I demand that we talk about this now. Yeah, we've got an issue that yeah, we can't. And the other person is trying to withdraw from that. Um, pursuer distancer is, is someone that's being aggressive about it, and the first other person is trying to um, kind of withdraw from it or, or distance themselves. So similar, but slightly different. They're not the pursuer is not necessarily demanding it. They just continue to pursue the conversation. So they'll bring it up again, or they'll follow you around. Or <laughs> I had one story where I, I knew of someone that was pursuing, 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 and the, and the person was distancing, distancing. And this was, um, it was a married couple, and they, he was, she was pursuing him, and he was trying to distance himself all through the house. And he's like, I literally found myself in the shower, like, what am I doing in here? And she was like, still talking to him because <laughs> he had like backed himself into the bathroom and yeah. then backed himself into the shower and he's like so he's like shutting the shower curtain. <laughs> so pursuer distance is hard. Um, and then really an interesting one here is fear and shame, um, anxiety in one will stimulate shame in the other, and vice versa. So just this idea of a lot of anxiety and feeling like. Um, you know, I'm making these mistakes and I'm afraid and it just kind of this con together, this building together of fear that, that kind of is fed by um, shame and anxiety and, and so that can be a hard one to kind of break out of within those dyads. Okay. Um, so without, with, with most of us, we're not in those three sort of relational dyads that are very, very difficult to overcome, but we're in regular kind of basic relationships where um, we're working hard to have good dynamics, but oftentimes it's a personality thing or it's just we're the, the combined personality is just creating a lot of sort of issues that are hard to overcome. So we can, we can become derailed in our, in our communication as hard as we try. So oftentimes as I talk through like different communication theories or strategies, People say, but I really want to talk about <laughs> this, <person. laughs> this particular type of personality. So yeah. still today, uh, uh, seven uh, personality um, types that have come up for me um, over time in, a, in leadership coaching as difficult. Yeah. And, what, and, and what we want to do is talk about them, and then we'll talk about well, so how do you deal, and, and even more specific, to be very practical, what do you say? Mm -hmm. okay. So the explosives. So, these types of personalities are very volatile, generally speaking. They're inconsistent and they're unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Their explosiveness can come out in lots of different ways. It can be very passive, you know, like I storm out. Like I'm, I'm still, I'm not, a, like, it's not all the people that are screaming, yeah. but they have sort of this emotional, explosive style of personality. So they fly off the handle quite easily. They're, they um, kind of empower others around them to walk on eggshells. No one's sure when it's going to be calm, um, they stifle dialogue often by shutting people down. Someone will say, well, I have an idea. Well, we're not interested in your idea, or you know, ideas in general, or more specifically, what you have to say yeah. right now, which can be 
very, very um, problematic to organizational cultures. It breeds sort of this hostility in the culture that's oftentimes sort of underground, but there's a sense oftentimes of artificial harmony and a lot of insecurity within the relationships in the organization. So what do you do? It's a tough one. Well, I, my, as I've really thought about it a lot, it best advice I, I have here is whether the storm um, remain calm no matter what. And that doesn't mean that you put up with this behavior that's undesirable. But if it's your boss and they have authority and power over you, it's hard to have sort of this redirecting feedback conversation with someone who's superior to you. Right, especially so, in the heat of the moment. Exactly. In the heat of the moment, we, what we really need to do is just stay calm and not go there. Not um, what some researchers call oftentimes go, we need to go to the balcony and have some real um, sort of mindfulness or thought around what's really going on. And if I get, what happens if I get into the middle of this? Well, what will happen is, I know because I've seen it happen, is we'll both become derailed. We'll turn into sort of this communication death spiral <laughs> where it's just like, no, you're right. You're wrong. No, you're wrong. You're wrong. We hate each other. Like, it's, it can become name calling. It becomes very mature oftentimes. Yeah. It's not productive, and oftentimes we end up saying things that we don't, you know, that we do regret, that we wish we hadn't said, and it's just generally very problematic. So best to stay out of the storm, weather the storm, and remain calm. Practice your leveling skills. You know, try to keep things, um, you know, rephrasing, pausing, you know, try to, try to help encourage them through your nonverbal communication to stay calm as well. So what do you say? Um, this is a hard one, and it really, you have to think about the relational dynamics and the power dynamics, but it's the best way that you can, and particularly if you have a relatively healthy relationship, um, you just have the, really the best tool in your toolkit is request that they refrain from behavior that is um, reflective of making you feel like you're under attack, mm -hmm. so whether that's snapping or bullying, um, and tell them that it's hard for you to have a conversation when you feel like you're being, that you're under attack, and that if they want to have continued conversation, that you please request that they would do that in a mutually respectful way. Okay. But good luck with that. Good luck with that, right? Well, I, it's I, a tough one, but that's yeah. about. Those are the best tools. And you're always trying to maybe re-engage with them when they're not so emotional. Absolutely. And calm down. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So another difficult personality that I I've sort of noted over time is. The selfies um, that have a real bad case of me, myself, and I, <laughs> right. my, myopic thinking, um, they only see themselves in sort of this distorted view of their own importance in the world. They com and communicating with them is very difficult. If you're in a conversation with a narcissist or a power monger, monger or someone who is really just in it for themselves, it's really apparent when they are kind of bored or done with you or the conversation because they really start to zone out. They start to they can't talk about themselves yeah, anymore. <laughs> so they get bored. They get really distracted, um, and really they just want to, they filter what you're saying because they really only want to hear things that feed their ego, that reject things that don't fit into their own sort of you know world that revolves around themselves. And so it's a really really difficult time have a meaningful relationship, and the research pretty, is pretty interesting here that they don't really know how to have meaningful relationships and often don't have mm. many, if any at all. They're very, very good at sales oftentimes um, and self-promotional type of activities. Okay. So they'll oftentimes nail a sales, uh, I mean a um, job interview or a salary negotiation or something that were, or a sale um, because, a sale because they're, they're very good at promoting themselves and what whatever it is that they're selling or uh -huh. et cetera. But once they get into the organization, they have a really hard time creating long lasting relationships because that takes give and take. Yeah. <laughs> they're only taking. And they're only taking. So how to deal, um, the best advice is not as best as you can, don't go there. In other words, I mean you still have to work with selfies. You still have to you have to be um, interacting with them. But the best thing I've seen is just to really just stay task oriented with them, mm -hmm. create sort of this plan to you know keep them focused by saying, okay, well, that's really interesting, but coming back to what we're talking about here, <laughs> right. and so by this date, maybe we could have this done. Do you, is that clear? And, and, and just 
realizing that a meaningful, really deep relationship is something that isn't something they're naturally able to do or really interested in doing. You know, the interesting research on narcissism especially is the best way to find out if someone is narcissist, like extreme narcissism. We have a little bit of it. We have some self-preservation and some self-promotion in us, otherwise, you know, kind of be invisible. But All right. um, is ask them. A narcissist usually brag about it, truly. Ask them if they are a narcissist, mm -hmm. and they'll brag about it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, As if it's something like a badge of honor. Yeah. That's more of like kind of extreme level. But often, I mean, you'd be surprised how many of them are proud of being a narcissist. So, so it's hard to have a relationship So in that, that bank account there. So you uh -huh. can kind of have those conversations. Absolutely. It's really, um, you know, you're kind of starting fresh every time. Yeah, and they bring a lot to the table oftentimes. I mean, they're really good at oftentimes presentations. Mm -hmm. um, they're often very charismatic. Um, I mean, it always depends. But they have a lot of confidence, and that can be read as chariz charisma. Uh -huh. But in the long term, it sort of breaks down, and then you start to say there's not often a lot of substance. Sure. A lot of flash. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you do? You just, like I said, you don't go there. Try to stay on track and try not to get <laughs> sucked into their spiraling knee vortex um, as best as you possibly can. Nice. Keep them on task. And then um, uh, one, one thing real quick to say is just yeah. um, let them know that um, you're going to just stick to the facts and, and be forthcoming on that. Let's just talk about what we need to get done. Okay. So then they, and they don't get into, well, one day I did this, and that was really great, and then I did this, and that was even more <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the next one are the negatrons. Um, these personalities are <laughs> negative. Um, they refuse to really explore alternatives or options and have an open mind, because oftentimes they come to conclusions about the world pretty quickly, and these observations are within the filter of a real negative perspective. They're pessimistic, it's oftentimes quite small-minded point of view, and they're stuck in that. Okay. So, you know, I, I've recently worked with a team that has a very, very strong negative personality, extremely strong negative personality. The whole team, you said? Her, one in particular oh, member of the team. Yeah. She was, um, and it was um, like literally kind of like a, a disease spreading among the whole team <laughs> because everybody was kind of latching on to this negativity. And I had a, a conversation with a leader and said, is this, you know, something that um, you, know, we, you think that you've changed, you know, and turn around? Yeah. And he said, no, I really just think that this is who she is, and I don't really know what to do. And at that point, you have to sort of do a little bit of a cost-benefit analysis to say, you know, if you've tried and tried and tried to have these conversations, these sort of performance management style of conversations, and hope for uh, a different style, of communication, but you just feel like that isn't going to change. Um, you have to kind of, in a way, look at the bigger picture of the organization and whether or not this person fits on the team. Yeah. Because the effect is very, very dramatic when you have an, a strong personality that's very negative. Mm. Very dramatic. It can happen. I've seen turnarounds, but it's a lot of uh, work for the leader to say things like, I need you to be a team player. I need you to try to look on the bright side and need, you know, and having these follow-up conversations on like a weekly one-on-one. -on -one yeah. And um, and hoping that the other team members aren't sort of feeding the negativity and, and bringing that out in the team with sort of that presence of the negativity there. All right, so how to deal, what to do. Um, the best thing to do is really ask questions to try to move them out of the negativity. And um, every time the sort of negatron personality is spinning things negatively, um, as a leader or within that team, do what you can to do what's the sort of reframing of complaints. So um, we often, you know, complaining is okay when it's justified complaints, you know, and, and it actually can bring in some important things to the team, you know, understanding the reality of certain things, unless it's a really, really negative, pessimistic reality, and that's not helpful. But it's just that when we have what we call justified complaints, oftentimes we'll say, well, this isn't working, um, or this is difficult, but these are some solutions. So complaints with solutions mm -hmm. is the only way that complaints are really helpful to the organization. Yeah. So we, need to, we need to push them to offer solution. And then what to say, really one thing you can say if you are having that sort of one-on-one -on -one performance style of 
conversation is like letting them know that this pessimism or negativity is really not grounded in anything substantive. Mm -hmm. And it's really making it harder for the team because we're living in this sort of negative context as a team. And what we need to do is understand the power of positive psychology and power of positive, or rather optimism. Yeah. And it's going to increase our entire team performance and individual performance as a whole. And so what we want to do is we need to sort of have that five to one ratio of five positive to one, or at the very least three positives to every one negative. Yeah. And work for that as leaders because it makes all the difference. All right. I have a few more here for you. So the sneaky ones. <laughs> so these are people who are, you know, manipulative or conniving, et cetera, or breaking things down. Um, they, this is uh, important. These are important folks to watch out for. Um, they really do undermine health and the dialogue and the trust. Mm -hmm. um, they often feign authenticity, and but are operating under these false pretenses. Um, of everything that I have observed in my work, I think that someone who's breaking down the trust of the team is almost, of everything, the most difficult thing to repair. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if it's worth it. Okay. If you have someone on your team who's absolutely um, not trustworthy and is not someone who you feel like has integrity, um, then I think that you really have to look at that. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's, you know, there's a sort of a continuum if someone has, sure. you know, a level of, uh, you're not sure, that might be something different. But this is where we're, I've seen where they're absolutely not trustworthy. They're rewriting history, saying things like, that's not how I remember things, and manipulating conversations, and mm -hmm. just breaking down the team, and, and saying one thing to one person, one thing to another person. Absolutely watch out for this. Um, you can call them out on it, name the game, say, um, something's not adding up here. Um, this isn't, you know, kosher or copacetic or cruel right. even. Yeah. Um, it's not right. However, if that conversation is happening over a long period of time and you're not seeing a change in behavior, I would be very worried about that as an organizational head um, and just making sure that that um, kind of behavior isn't um, part of your team. All right. The next one is the wannabes. Um, it's really what it boils down to, the wannabes. I mean, because it's nice to have a people pleaser on your team in some ways, right? It's the brown nose, or it's like it actually brings in a level of positivity in a way because everything is like, oh, that was so amazing. You know, it, that, that's so great that you did that, Charles. You're like the best boss ever, right? <laughs> that, that's wonderful. The biggest issue here is it's this insincerity or this lack of authenticity. Right. In it. It makes it so difficult to work with them. And they will literally yes you to death. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and they'll do that in lieu of having a meaningful conversation. Hmm. So you, it starts to feel quite shallow. Um, and it's similar to a selfie. Yeah. But it's, their whole intention is pleasing you, not pleasing themselves. Yeah, sometimes you just want <laughs> an opinion from someone. So disagree with me on something here. You know? Yes. So it's a challenge a little. Challenge. Yeah. Because that adds value to me as a leader if you just get a bunch of yeses. So this is where the arrow from them is always down. Mm -hmm. always. always down. And I heard in a, in a particular organization, um, someone told me once, we have a strategy with our boss that we never tell him good news. I mean, bad news, ever. We never <laughs> tell him any bad news, ever. <laughs> and it just, it makes us all, it makes everything so much easier. And I wanted to say, like, did he did he always lose it when, or did she lose it when the, they got bad news, or what? Are these yeah, ones? it was kind of one of those environments. It was extremely competitive, and and they, the the CEO had kind of surrounded himself with kind of yes people because that was the what you know that mm -hmm. what they what the CEO could handle, and the team had learned that through their um, interaction that that's the way that was the best strategy. So essentially. The CEO had a team of wannabes or people pleasers on yeah. his team that just wanted him to be pleased. Uh, the research is absolutely clear here that um, when you have a team that doesn't give you any kind of um, pushback or any kind of real authentic opinion, you're hurting yourself as a leader because mm -hmm. you're not getting any real, real value in the fact that you're getting a diversity of opinions. You're getting a lot of group think, which is not productive. Yeah. 
So make it clear that you would rather have an authentic conversation you know, that is real. So if you're kind of calling it out, what to say, you're essentially saying, I mean, and you don't have to exactly phrase it this way, but please stop just saying things that you think that I want to hear, right? <laughs> just say, like, I, well, I hired you for what you bring to the table, and I want to encourage that you feel confident and comfortable to share your real true opinions and that you don't have to feel nervous. Like, you're not going to get fired if you say, I don't agree with you. Right, right. If people are thinking that, then there's a problem. Yeah. As a leader, you need to look internally. If yeah, did you create that? The whole that? team is just always like, that's amazing, great idea, like, all the time. And you have a part in that. That's that relational dynamic yeah. and that personality that's being co-created. Interesting. All right. So this one's kind of a unique one. <laughs> Sometimes um, I, I, I think that, you know, the, they have, the clueless have the best of intentions. <laughs> They're just not always clued in, and yeah. so that's a really hard one. Um, they sort of exist in their own reality. Um, it's often sort of unrecognizable to everyone else. If you're familiar, like uh, the Harry Potter series, it's like Luna Lovegood, that's her name. Mm -hmm. That little blonde, cute little girl that was just always in her own little world. Um, and, you know, that's so fun sometimes and so unique and, you know, quirky, but oftentimes it's so difficult to first of all manage and also to have a lot of productivity. Yeah. For people who are dreamers or flakes or drama queens, et cetera, where um, they're just they're just not really getting to the heart of the matter, what the real issues are. They're not addressing those issues. And oftentimes they're detracting from those constructive conversations where we're really saying this is what needs to get done because they're sort of existing in their own little world um, and not like attuned to what needs to be happening. Similar to a narcissist in a way. But quite different because they're not really thinking about themselves or, <laughs> <laughs> or even pleasing their boss. They're just kind of existing in their own little world. Oh boy. Um, anyhow, so how is it deal? Um, you have, this is one of my favorite pieces of advice. Like you have the conversation and cross your fingers that they get it. <laughs> Um, you really, you have to give it your best shot. Um, they often have quite a bit of positivity. They want to do well, um, but document everything. <laughs> but it's said because when it comes up again and they have no idea what's going on or what you talked about, you can maybe be pretty specific and say, well, let me pull out, you know, sort of the notes from our last conversation. Here right. are some of the things that we agreed upon. And then you can go from there. I mean, truly, it's, a difficult personality, but for the most part, sort of the dreamers and even the flakes, they they really don't have like this sort of conniving intentions of mm -hmm. the sneaky ones, and and they aren't really super self-absorbed. Um, so if you can get them on page and they're a, a, you know a decent performer um, of all of them, I think that this one's not. Super well, and sometimes are these the more creative ones that are always uh -huh. kind of jumping from new idea to new idea? Exactly. And so you, if you can, as a leader, you can kind of funnel what they do well and sort of keep them on task, whether that's with someone else that they're partnering with that's much more conscientious, mm -hmm. then you might have a real uh, great employee right here under your nose. You just didn't necessarily realize it because mm -hmm. the systems weren't in place. Right, right. You have to, watch, you have to be really, like I just said, conscientious about it as a leader as well. So you just kind of watch that kind of. So, um, one thing sort of you can say is you can ask them to, if you if you can say this in a way that they would be willing to hear it and be humble, and generally they, I hope that they would be, but just kind of the idea of mentioning, you know, I need you to sort of be more focused on the tasks at hand, focusing on the facts that are in front of you instead of being in sort of this sort of visionary, strategic, kind of frame it in a way that's like yeah. level of thinking, we need to sort of be more task oriented or focused on the details and having that conversation about that um, and hoping that they, you know, respond well to that and say, you know, I, I understand that I can start using more of a uh, task um, software or a calendar, calendar software to help me as well be a, um, productive. more productive. Perfect, yeah. Okay, so the kids, and I think this is our last one. I haven't been counting for seven, but so the kids, these are, the, if you've ever worked with the, the <laughs> Sure, work with kids before. <laughs> <laughs> kids that are adults, um, yeah. that are really just kids that are trapped in adult bodies. Um, you know, this can come out in this idea of someone who's blaming others all the time. They're not taking personal responsibility. They're really whining about everything. They're looking for 
excuses uh, for everything, and they're very automatically defensive. Um, they're pouting um, to get attention, to attention rather, and then or they're gossiping just because they're stirring up trouble, um, getting in everybody's business. Not necessarily being productive, but they, that's what they prefer to do in a way is just to kind of find out what's going on with everybody. And so, it's a, this is a tricky one because you know we talked earlier about stage theory. Part of it is that they haven't really come into more of that adult stage of um, uh, behavior, even though they're an adult, mm -hmm. right? And so it's like, as a leader, you're trying to bring them into more of a uh, professional style of work and a little higher level of behavior, not not as, you know, bringing them from like a juvenile style into more of a um, senior sort of professional style of work or behavior. And and if it's, it's really difficult because a lot of times that is part of sort of just that personality they have. And so what, what can you do here? Um, and I think on the next slide it gives us some tips here. It says we can basically tell them directly how unbecoming and inappropriate that behavior is. But that's going to be kind of a difficult conversation. So yeah. you have to be, just like with every difficult conversation, again, putting it within the context of, of care and, and the concern, um, express that, um, you know, this behavior isn't um, giving us as a team and also as an individual the results that, that we're needing to see. And um, basically just kind of pointing it out to them and hoping that they can um, be willing, if they are highly defensive, we just talked about, um, they may not be willing to listen, but hoping that they can take that and really try to, um, you know, make that change with your kind of mentoring and, and empowering them to sort of behave in a, in a more professional manner. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so summary, when working with difficult personalities, kind of bring it all together, some of the things um, that I recommend is, first of all, we do our best using our emotional intelligence to read the room, um, thinking about what is the individual's personality and what are the relational dynamics so that I can understand how to best approach the situation from both a communication perspective and a relational perspective and understanding their unique personality. I mean, oftentimes they're... Uh, like I said earlier, there's so many great things about these personality traits, right? Mm -hmm. And just sometimes these personality traits will go one, will go too far in one direction or another, and it'll create uh, sort of difficulties for yeah. us, right? So we we need to recognize that. Um, and first of all, we need to kind of assess it and and try to understand the difference between the individual personality and the relational dynamics, and understand what kind of what's the heart of the matter. Um, Understand or recognize the employee's conversational transact. These patterns of behavior or choices of communication will give us clues of what to do next. So if I know that you have an explosive personality and you're leaning toward like one up, one up, one up, mm -hmm. what I need to do is first of all start to be aware of that and, and train my ear to try to learn to hear that and see it and observe it in my own mindfulness as a manager and say, I, I know that I can see what's going here. I can see that Charles is heading into a real sort of explosive moment here, yeah. and I have tools in my toolkit to be able to change the course of that conversation. The worst choice is going to be to respond in kind. What I need to do is stay calm, and I need to think about what I can say, what choice I can make to lead to, which will have a different consequence, will lead to a better outcome. Okay. So for example, if we are having an interaction, and you're, you know, I can tell you're, you're getting frustrated enough that you're about to leave. You know, one thing that I could say before you get to that point is something to do with, it sounds to me like this conversation isn't very productive or isn't going well or isn't, you know, and, and assuming that we have a strong relationship. So the conference, so I can say that to you in a way that won't make you more defensive. Right? Yeah, yeah. How about we just take like a few minutes, take a break, let's take, you know, a moment and let's talk about it maybe in 20 minutes or this afternoon again. And, and would that be okay? And oftentimes, if you can kind of get them like out of their own emotional reactiveness uh -huh. um, by creating sort of this proactive like plan, let's maybe we can talk about it later, or what about this option, or what do you think about this, and create more collaboration or move the conversation with leveling or with you know creating sort of these different dynamics, we can um, really change the course of the, that interaction that will help improve our relationship. So that's related to the facilitate leveling to change that direction of the communication so that we can get more cooperative and less um, 
having that less amount of contention with, with our relationship. Finally, accepting the facts that employees' personalities <laughs> make that relationship sometimes hard to manage and difficult to change. So I think that we need to not set ourselves up for this huge amount of transition, uh, transformational pressure. So I have to change this entire person's personality. I think it's realistic and reasonable to say, that's not going to happen. Like yeah. I can give, I can influence, I can give strategies, I can, I can mentor, but I'm not going to be able to, um, well I shouldn't at least give that, make, have that pressure to change an entire personality or change an entire relational dynamic. Um, but I'm going to keep trying. I'll keep trying to do things that are positive, mm -hmm. trying to move things in productive directions, and I'm going to keep trying to work with that person with the different strategies I mentioned before, and like, and as always, kind of just hope for the best and see what happens. Yeah, because I think your your job, especially as a manager, looking at some of these uh, personalities, is to really understand how to work with them effectively. Exactly. And it won't probably be easy with all of them, but right. you'll know that you need to interact with this person in a different way than you do the other person. So you need to be the one that's flexing yes. your styles in a way to get the best outcome. Absolutely. So um, I was going to ask another question along those lines. And and actually, let me, um, let me wrap things up a little bit here and provide the activity codes that everyone uh, wants. Um, so the HRCI and the SHRM activity codes are listed there. If you'd like to, um, if you're interested in this training program or our other training programs, uh, please let me know. I can provide you an estimate on what it would cost for Marcy to come or some of our other trainers for, to uh, conduct this particular workshop with your teams. Um, but in terms of uh, managing conflicts, and so you look at this and say, okay, well, if I'm an individual contributor, working with my boss is a different dynamic than working uh, as a boss with the people that you uh, work with. But still, I think even as a boss, that relationship dynamic, understanding the type of relationship you have first, gives you more or less power, I guess, to help control the conversation or the outcome. Absolutely. So I think that we, what we don't want is to get stuck in sort of this victim stance of, I have this person that I'm working with that has a difficult personality and there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah. And that's my point of bringing up sort of this relational theory is you have choices, absolutely, and it, you, you have the ability to um, change the course of a, of a communication dynamic just because you have a role in it. It's a combined co-created um, personality where you may say, you know what, I'm going to try and be more positive with this person that's extremely negative, mm -hmm. and I'm going to see what happens. If I'm commiserating with them and I'm creating more negativity, then we're co-creating an extreme yeah. amount of negativity together. So we have a choice. You know, we have, and we need to be very, very mindful. Of it. And the key is keeping your eye sort of on what do I really want here. A lot of times we know what we think we know what we want, which may be I know that I want to be right and I want to win this argument. <laughs> right. right. That happens a lot. Um, my end game. But that is like more of our kind of our ego and sort of our own pride, and those things are kind of getting in the mix. Whereas if we're more mindful and say, okay, well, that will feel good for a moment, but it's not going to be the greatest thing for me as a manager or even an individual contributor to put someone in sort of their place or put someone down or make it so that I can feel better about how I did in that, in that yeah. argument. Yeah. What I really, really want is a better working relationship, a positive work environment, a high level of performance for my team and myself, and I need to have an absolute willingness myself to do what I need to do to get to that outcome, make the choices that lead to the right consequences outcomes. And sometimes what it really does require is we have to follow our pride and say, oh, I've got a good one. I could, <laughs> I, could, I could just sling that one right back and yeah. that would be a good comment. But that's not what I really want to do here. I need to, I need to be mindful of the fact that I'm going to weather the storm. I'm going to talk to him again and say we need to have communication that's more um, mutually respectful. I need to have the ability and the world and the willingness to make those kinds of choices for the betterment of the organization and myself and yeah. my team. Kind of about understanding your locus of control, exactly. right? How much power you have. For sure. Well, Marcy, thank you very much, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I look forward to a follow-up email from me with uh, some links to some of our content, and we look forward to having you join us on a future webinar. Thanks, everybody. Bye.